Okay, now that we have waited for the traditional five minutes, uh, let me welcome you all to this uh, seminar from the uh, Institute for Future Health. First of all, I feel very lucky and very good that I remember about the talk. And I congratulate all of you that you remember uh, about this talk. As my friend here, can you hear me? So, my friend here, Matt, uh, reminded me that I should remember to tell you that both speakers today are very shy. They don't want to talk much about themselves. So, uh, I will tell you a little bit about them. Uh, first, uh, Matt here uh, was trained as a neurosurgeon. Uh, he practiced neurosurgery for about 25 years and uh, after that he decided that uh, he would rather be a researcher uh, than a neurosurgeon. So he got into the research related to neurosurgery and uh, then he decided that that was not enough so he also decided to do MBA and uh, now he is a researcher here who keeps on talking always about genome to transcriptome to metabolome and keeps on confusing me. He will tell you all about those things today. My other friend here, Mark Maxton, he judges cognitive aging. So he was trained in the cognitive science and psychiatry related aspects. And he will, uh, he's expert in evaluating cognitive behavior and that, that's how the cognitive decay uh, of people. What we are going to see here today is one of the most uh, talked about disease, uh, particularly Alzheimer's related aspect. But uh, both of them have been dealing enough with computers so that they are going to try to synthesize how computer science and uh, neurosciences come together. With that, thank you. Okay. So we're going to do a tag team presentation today. So uh, Matt and I are going to trade off. So I'm going to lead off uh, focusing on the bits that um, I know most about, and that is the, the clinical aspects and the clinical trials that, that lead up to the big data that we'll be talking about. And hopefully Matt is going to tell you um, how, uh, why we need big data analytics to help us with this problem. So, um, I thank you for the introduction. I'm, I'm not going to go any farther than that. So, just suffice to say that my specialty is um, cognitive uh, neuroscience, clinical neuropsychology. So, I, I'm a practicing clinical neuropsychologist, and what I do as part of the team is, is I do <coughs> cognitive phenotyping, which basically means I do assessments of the cognitive uh, abilities of, of the patients that we see and then classify them based on their cognitive abilities so that we can then study them to see uh, if we can find biomarkers of disease. So um, I'll get into it a little bit more. Mark is being polite. All of the people that he's going to describe in this study, <clears throat> he's personally evaluated, and that's some 500 plus people. So uh, you can imagine 500 plus checking them neuropsychologically over a period of five years. Uh, that's a lot of lot of evaluations. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little shy. Uh, yeah, so I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about the subjects that we saw, but I did see all of these uh, subjects. And that's an important point because um, the, the, um, the accuracy of the cognitive phenotyping is really critical if we're going to make um, sound inferences about the biology. You really got to know the groups that you're talking about first before you can actually delve into the biology. So let me start off with just a little bit of background since we're in a completely different school over here now, not the School of Medicine and Neurology. We're talking about Alzheimer's disease. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a, a progressive neurodegenerative disease uh, that affects older adults. It's characterized primarily by a specific pathological set, a set of pathological markers in the brain. Those are these uh, amyloid beta plaques. Uh, 
oops, right here, and these neurofibrillary tangles. These are present in normal people's brains at a very, very low level, but in Alzheimer's disease, they're present at very, very high levels in, in the brains, and that's part of what's uh, part of the disease process. But eventually, it's not the proteins that's, that are the problem. It's, it's that the, the disease causes um, atrophy of the brain, uh, shrinkage of the brain, neuronal loss, cell loss is really what causes the behavioral deficits. So Alzheimer's disease is a behavioral disorder that's characterized by these abnormal proteins that lead or are associated with the loss of neurons in the brain, the thinking cells in the brain. And ultimately, this leads to uh, degradation of functional uh, uh, capacities and, uh, and ultimately quality of life. For those of you who don't know, this man is Alwa Alzheimer. He was the person who first described the disease uh, in the early uh, 20th century. And this is his patient, August Dieter. This is the first patient that was studied. Um, Alzheimer cared for her at a psychiatric an asylum in Vienna. And uh, when she uh, died, he looked at her brain and described these initial pathological features that then became known as Alzheimer's disease. So this is what we're studying. The reason why we study it is because um, it's a growing tidal wave of a problem, and we really don't have good methods to deal with this. This is just a representation. Right now, um, in the United States, there's about 5, 5.5 million individuals that have Alzheimer's disease, and that's projected to increase to about 15 million individuals in the United States by 2050. So over the next 30 years or so, we're expected to probably triple the number of individuals who have this disease. So Does that we're, develop the aging process? It's, it's probably a number of factors, but it's mostly due to the fact that we're living longer. So advances in medicine and healthcare have allowed us to live longer. Alzheimer's disease is an age-related disease. The older you get, the more uh, likely you are to get this disease, the higher your risk. This disease does not happen in 20-year-olds. It does in rare circumstances, but basically the, the average onset is about 72 years of age. So this is a, a disease of older adults. But we're living longer, we're, we've got better access to health care, and therefore the incidence and prevalence is going up. Um, but just some of these numbers are, are remarkable. If you, if you look at, um, here's the United States, 5 million individuals projected to increase 158% by 2050. That's what this larger circle represents. But some of these other uh, values, for example, in Southeast Asia, 222% increase by 2050, 380% uh, in increase in Africa, <coughs> Northern Africa. So this is not just a problem of the United States or Western civilization. This is a worldwide problem. And the big problem is that we really don't have good ways to treat this disease. We have no cures for the disease. We have really no way to modify the disease course. And the, the treatments that we do have available are uh, symptomatic, and they really don't work very well for most people. Now, in some people, they, they do work a little bit. But for most people, we really don't have good ways to treat, slow down, or stop this disease. And so that's why those numbers are so remarkable on that previous slide, is there, it's going to get out of control. Given that, um, we do have uh, some basis for, for moving forward, and one of those ideas is that if we can catch the disease early enough in its course, that we might be able to do something about it when the brain is still sort of healthy enough to receive treatment. By the time someone comes to my clinic and says, I'm forgetting where I parked my car, I don't remember if I put the laundry in the dryer or not, um, I'm forgetting what I had for breakfast, that sort of thing, probably the, the, the horse is out of the barn. It's too late to really do anything. The pathology has become so prevalent in the brain and so dense that the treatments that we have available really aren't doing much of anything. So the push now in neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's and others, is to start moving forward in time, sorry, backward in time, to see if we can detect the disease at an earlier state where we can actually intervene and do something about the course before it gets too bad that we can't do anything. So this is just a, a, a cartoon, this is not real data. But if we think about um, normal aging here, going across in through what we call the preclinical state of Alzheimer's disease, clinic, clinical uh, symptoms means they're in the clinic, they're showing up, they notice symptoms, we notice symptoms. Preclinical means the period of time 
when pathology might be in the brain, but the patient doesn't see the symptoms yet. That's a really important time for us because that's the time where we know this person has got their early stages of the disease, but it's still uh, early enough in time that we, can, we might be able to do something about it. So we're really <coughs> interested in this preclinical phase, but if you continue on and nothing happens, you then move into a prodromal phase called mild cognitive impairment and then frank dementia. And these uh, vertical lines here represent the demarcation of when preclinical turns into MCI. And MCI, this is typically when people show up in the clinic at about this stage right here, when they're starting to see cognition and clinical function start to become impaired. So in here, there's pathology going on by those beta amyloid plaques and tau tangles, but cognition and clinical function is not impaired yet. So this is the, the point in time when we want to look for in these people. The problem is, how do you know that someone's got, is going to get memory loss when they don't have it yet? If, if it's a clinically defined uh, syndrome, if it's defined by the presence of memory loss that I can see on my cognitive assessment and the patient notices, how do you know that someone's going to get that in the future when they don't have it right now? That's the challenge. And that's, that's the big uh, problem that we face in biomarker development. Because what we want to do is we want to find some sort of surrogate for the eventual conversion to disease in people who are asymptomatic. And that's what a biomarker is going to help us do. A biomarker is a biological sign or symptom that we can measure that reflects some underlying disease. Think of, for example, a blood pressure cuff. And uh, blood pressure is a biomarker for hypertension. So it's something we can measure. It's easy. It's cost effective. And it tells us about the underlying pathology that's going on. So that's what our work is, is to, dis is to discover biomarkers of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. There are a lot of different ways that you can do this. Um, for example, you can measure the fluid that surrounds the brain. You can put a small needle in the back, and neurosurgeons like Dr. Fiendaka do this. And you can withdraw a little bit of fluid that surrounds the brain, and you can measure the amount of amyloid that's in there. And you can tell if there's, there's changes in amyloid and if this person is developing these plaques. You can also do um, relatively non-invasive imaging uh, using a PET ligand or a positron emission tomography ligand that will tell you if there's amyloid in the brain. Um, you can take uh, fancy pictures and high-definition pictures of what the brain actually looks like to see if there's loss of tissue. Um, however, and then there's other genetic uh, things as well that we can do. But the problem is, is that many of these are invasive, a needle in the back in the spine, that's not fun. Um, they're costly. These PET scanners cost several million dollars. Uh, it's very expensive to put people in these. And there are also risks associated with imaging someone because a radio ligand is needed to be placed into the, the system to see. Uh, so these are expensive, um, invasive procedures. And moreover, they're just telling us whether the person has amyloid. And unfortunately, there's not a, a, a strong enough relationship between the presence of amyloid and the development of these clinical symptoms. That is to say, if you have amyloid in your brain, that does not mean that you're going to get memory loss down the road. It's a strong correlation, but it's not one. So these are imperfect, and they're expensive, and there's a lot of reasons why we might want to move beyond this. So we're interested in blood, uh, and we're interested in developing blood-based biomarkers. Uh, blood is uh, easy to get. It's a very simple procedure that almost probably everybody in the room has done many, many times in their lives, given blood. Um, it's cheap uh, to, to collect a small five mil uh, tube of blood. And, and people are familiar with uh, very few risks, um, you know, bruising or some minor bleeding is about it. So blood provides a really nice uh, window to look at what's going on biologically in the body that might be able to tell us something about what's going on in the brain and people who are, uh, are going to get this disease treatment. So our laboratory focuses on uh, the development of blood biomarkers for neurodegenerative diseases, in particular Alzheimer's, but others as well. And this is the, this is the general schematic of what we do and what we're interested in. If we think about this, this thing called systems biology, and one of the major premises is that we have this uh, sort of idea that, that these aspects of uh, biology from epigenetics to genetics to transcripts to proteome, to the to proteins, to metabolites, and then eventually these things, this, these metabolic pathways produce the phenotype. Phenotype meaning the clinical behavior, so memory loss or confusion, um, that sort of thing. 
and that we can access these different things that are going on in the biology through the blood, and we can query them and understand things about uh, by studying the environmental factors, DNA, RNA, proteins, and all of these metabolites, things like sugars, fats, um, uh, nucleotides, uh, things like that. So what we want to do is we want to query these systems via the blood and measure these outcomes and see if we can develop biomarkers based on them. That's, that's the general idea. So in 2008, we uh, began a study uh, that, that we now call the Rochester Orange County Aging Study, or ROCAS. And this was um, when I was in Rochester and uh, Mass and others were at Georgetown and we collaborated on this study. And we also had a collaborator here, Claudia Kawas, who helped us with uh, participants here in Orange County. So this is the Rochester Orange County study. But the idea was to, to, to actually prospectively follow a group of older adults who are at risk for Alzheimer's disease, but do not have it. And we wanted to determine if we could uh, see who was going to get the disease and who was not. Uh, we were going to try and develop a biomarker that we could use primarily for clinical trials. And eventually, you'd like to develop this into a test, um, some sort of diagnostic test. Um, you know, we certainly aren't there yet, but that's, that's an ultimate goal. So the, the study is, was pretty straightforward. The initial cohort consisted of about 525 individuals who were enrolled in the study. And every year, they came in for a cognitive evaluation by me. Um, I saw all these people, and we collected their blood. We took a blood sample. We put the blood sample in the freezer. And every year, they came back for up to five years. Not everybody had five years of visits. but um, And these were older adults who are at high risk for Alzheimer's disease based on their age but did not have it yet. So one of the exclusion factors was having AD or MCI and some other things as well. We uh, did careful characterization of their cognitive function. Because Alzheimer's is a clinically characterized disorder, I wanted to make sure that cognitively these people did not have the disease when they entered my study and that when we said that they got the disease that I was very confident that they did. So I did a, a set of um, cognitive tests that uh, is a neuropsychologist, I see a couple in the room here, um, will understand this is, this is kind of the standard setup for a neuropsychological battery. And we wanted to determine whether these normal people cognitively actually developed memory loss over time. Um, the bloods were collected in the morning, and we tried to very hard to standardize the collection of these samples. Uh, they were collected while these subjects were fasting, and they held their meds overnight so that we, if we were going to look in the blood for things. We wanted to make sure that we minimized any noise uh, by asking them to withhold uh, food and medications overnight. We collected the blood in Rochester and Orange County, shipped it on ice to Georgetown in D.C., where the plasma from the blood was separated into aliquots and then stored in deep freeze. And what we did, well, this is, this is the, cog the set of cognitive tests, again, for the neuropsychologists probably are interested in this, but um, what we did is we computed disease scores. Uh, composite score based on the cognitive tests in their domains so that we could understand, uh, we could collect one score for attention, one for executive function, language, memory, and visual perceptual functions. And these are the tests that we use, and these are standardized tests that we use. But what we did is we then took all of the subjects who were enrolled in our study and we wanted to define who was normal. One of the big questions is in, in, in these sorts of studies, people will define the disease state first and then say everybody else is a, is a control. So here are my cases. I define them. I find them. I separate them out. Everybody else, you're a control, which is not really a good way to go about it, in my opinion. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to define normality in a statistical way. And so we looked at the distribution. We fit everybody to a robust distribution based on their cognitive z-score for memory. And we took only those people who were within 0.7 standard deviations of the mean on this memory test. And we said, okay, now these people have normal memory. These people down here don't. So we don't want to call them controls because they're not quite normal. Um, but I want to strictly define normal group. And then the abnormal group were those who fell on the tail, 1.3 standard deviations below the mean. And these were our, our Alzheimer's patients. So they were defined by memory impairment as either normal or disorder impaired. We then um, separated out, based on these groups, cognitively normal, those that had mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, 
and those who basically couldn't be defined. And so we had a group of people that we said, we don't know what you are. You're not normal. You're not impaired. You might be moving between the two. We don't know, but we're not going to use you because we don't want to add noise into our analysis. Our interesting uh, analysis, uh, the, the analysis we were interested in is these converters. So this is now we're adding the dimension of time. So converters are people who come into the study cognitively normal and then convert or uh, end up having memory impairment at some time during the study. And so our real analysis here is looking at the blood of people who were cognitively normal but then converted and comparing them to people who were cognitively normal and stayed cognitively normal. So that's the basic design. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's not um, terribly complicated. Uh, we ended up in, in a discovery cohort of um, 18 people who phenoconverted, and we matched them to 53 controls. It turns out that some of the people who entered our study actually did meet criteria for Alzheimer's disease, even though they didn't carry the diagnosis. They had never been told they had Alzheimer's. But when I saw them in my uh, analysis, I said, this, this is early Alzheimer's disease that this person had. I didn't tell them because this isn't a clinical evaluation, but for our research purposes, those people met criteria, uh, the, the published criteria for Alzheimer's disease. So we included them as well because they were an interesting group. The reason why we got them is probably because this was a study of memory and aging and who signs up for that, people who have memory problems. So they probably suspected that they had some issues and signed up to a free study to get a free evaluation by a specialist to other memory. And this, this is a common effect that we see. So it's not surprising that we had those people. But we separated them out into a discovery group and then a validation group. So the idea is what we wanted to develop the biomarker in our discovery group, and then we've got a censored group here in the validation that we would then test the uh, biomarker on that validation group. And then there's this group of people who, that were neither uh, controls or converters or Alzheimer's, and they just we didn't, we didn't use them. Um, suffice, I, I'll go through. They were all matched, um, and they were all of normal age and education. Highly educated and uh, older, 98% uh, Caucasian. So this is, a, this is not a representative group of, of the United States by any means. Uh, but the, mean, the, the, the thing that I want to point out is from the converter when they were normal at baseline to when they actually developed the disease, the average was 2.1 years. So the people entered the study, and about 2.1 years later, on average, they developed a memory, a memory disorder. So here's the cognitive data, just to convince you, uh, for example, in memory, that our normal controls were above the mean, our converter pre's, meaning the people who converted, but when they were at the, at the normal, were above the mean as well. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, at the mean. And then the after, these are the same people, after they converted, they're below. And here's the people who had Alzheimer's disease, they have memory dis impairment. So this falls out exactly the way that we'd want, because that's the way we define the groups. Um, and then here's just another to show that the memory loss in, at the baseline to afterwards is below that cutoff of 1.3 standard deviation, so in memory. So we did, uh, so then we took the blood. We, took, we identified those individuals who converted, and we went to the freezer and we pulled the blood samples out. <coughs> Up to this point, the blood samples hadn't been touched. So we pulled out the samples from those individuals, and we did untargeted metabolomics using mass spec. This is a standard way to look at the abundance of small molecules in the blood, the metabolites, the fats, the nucleotides, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and, and suffice to say, this is a, a, a rigorous workup, and it's, it's what we did. But we didn't go in looking for specific metabolites. We just said, give us all the metabolites that we can measure, and are there differences in those metabolites between the two groups? So this was an untargeted analysis. And out of about 4,500 metabolites that we could measure, um, we used LASSO and a logistic regression model to classify the two groups. We got a very nice result with an a, a rock AUC of 0.96, meaning that a group of metabolites could tell us with very high accuracy who was going to phenoconvert prior to phenoconversion based on these metabolites. It turns out that some of those metabolites, when we went back to identify what they were, were fats and lipids. So then our next step was why don't we go ahead and do targeted metabolomics analysis? That is, only look at lipids and see if that tells us, in, so taking a deeper look at lipids in particular, and seeing if that could tell us about dissociating the groups. 
And it turns out that, that the model was able to pick 10 lipids, primarily acylcarnitines and phosphatidylcholines, that could distinguish between the groups with very high accuracy. Now, these are the individual <coughs> species, metabolites. These are the 10. Um, and these are the normal controls, the converter pre, the converter post, and our Alzheimer group. And what you might see here, it's kind of hard to see, but a, a general pattern that looks sort of like this, where the normal controls are a little bit higher, <coughs> the converter pre's are low, and the Alzheimer's are just a slightly bit higher. So you get this dip in those who are cognitively normal, but yet are starting to see, we're starting to see some biological change in these people prior to them getting uh, memory loss. So we, we then went ahead um, and, and ran the analysis, and we got a 0.96 AUC for the targeted metabolomics for 10, those 10 lipids. Then we looked at our blinded validation group, that holdout group, and applied the same logistic regression model <coughs> to that. These are the raw data. Again, the uh, uh, schema looks like this. It's kind of that dip. And the rock is this, 0.92. So in the blinded validation group, we, we applied those 10 lipids to the, the, the converter pre's and got a very nice classification as well. We then tried to refine this a little bit more, so we added uh, a number of other metabolites to come up with a 24 metabolite index, and the idea here was how accurate can we get this, this measure if we're, if we're not using lasso, but just trying to get as many as we could that, that would give us the highest. <clears throat> Excuse me, we get our, an AUC of 99.5 and allows us to completely separate the groups. So these are the normal controls, and these are the converter pre's, and there's a complete separation there, so there's no overlap. Telling us that this panel of 24 metabolites gives us 100% accuracy in, in identifying who's gonna get the disease. So we end up coming back to um, what we think we've, we've at least established in principle is to say, we can find in, in blood something uh, that we can look for specifically that's going to tell us um, who's going to get this disease? And what we were looking at is this, the metabolome. Uh, so metabolites here. You can see that we have these whole other layers of the system's uh, biology that we haven't even addressed yet. So from blood, we can get access to all of these things. And I just want to end on my piece on this slide, which kind of just shows the tip of the iceberg, which is if you think about the demographic information, age, sex, you know, how long they went to school, that sort of thing. The cognitive data that we collected, there may have been 50 variables in the demographics, maybe 50 in the cognitive data. The metabolomics, we collected about 4,500 metabolites that we measured. We also have the proteomic data that we didn't look at, and there's oh, uh, roughly 1,500 variables there or so. The transcriptome, these are uh, RNA uh, transcripts, maybe about 200,000 of those. And the genome, maybe 20,000 or so. These are rough estimates. And then the epigenome could be, uh, you know, multitudes of that. We have a lot of data that we haven't even looked at yet. Moreover, we only looked at a cross-section at one point in time. We also have visit two for these people, these 525 individuals. We have visit three. Some of them have all the way up to visit five. So we have a huge, huge, huge data set that we have not even begun to integrate yet and we really need to start doing that. So we have a snapshot, and it's a very, very small snapshot that we're looking at. But we have very promising, I think, results that are telling us that uh, dysregulation of lipids in particular might herald this early preclinical state. And so I'll leave it at that, and Mass, you can take over and make it all, make it all work better. out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mark, that was great. Okay, <clears throat> so we have an abundance of data. If we look at what that data is in a little bit more detail, a lot of this stuff for, uh, for some of you that have had biology uh, is, is nothing new. But again, the, I think the matrix that Mark put up there is very instructive as to the fact that we've just barely started to scratch uh, the amount of information available in our data sets currently. This is just to go through the different uh, breakdown of the genome, the epigenome, et cetera, down to the metabolome, just to give you an idea of the numbers that we're talking about in a little bit uh, different detail than what Mark showed, but uh, it's pretty much uh, consistent. There's, there's, a huge among, there's a huge number of data elements available uh, for expansion, 
And we also have a, a time frame analysis for each one of these. So you can imagine the, uh, the uh, numbers that we're talking about. So you've heard about biomarkers, metabolomics, and omics. The question is, what does it all mean to you? And uh, the fact is, is that both computer science and engineering, as well as the biological sciences and medicine, have a lot of things in common. And I've just made this array for you to look at and make some comparisons from components to networks we're talking from genes to organ systems. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. We do have commonalities. We have different languages. And it's going to be imperative for the success of these types of approaches and these types of analyses for us to start understanding each other's languages um, and terms so that we can hopefully get to, a, to an end result that's good for all of us. Systems biology is one of those terms that Mark had brought up, and I know a lot of you know more about this than I do, but systems biology is spawned from an understanding that complex systems require a different approach than relatively simple systems. Um, what's called a reductionistic approach is the approach that talks about the fact that the sum is made up of uh, its parts and that the study of the parts will allow you to understand the sum. So in this case, these, uh, these polygons uh, are of different colors are put together to make that, that whole uh, part down at the bottom. Whereas in holism, uh, the holistic approach or the systems biological approach takes the fact that there's different color schemes, it doesn't even talk about the fact that they have to be put together into a specific shape and that those shapes have to be integrated together to, um, to make this final uh, result. And so you actually talk about the, the um, result itself. You have all of the information from what the resulting um, rectangle is, and then you go back and try to understand the relationships related to the colors, where they go, and also how they are put together in, into a specific size and shape of uh, something that ends up resulting in the whole. What does that mean? <clears throat> so reductionistic approaches, you basically investigate the different parts, and you assume that if you understand the parts, you'll understand the whole. The systems approach takes a look at everything, and from looking at everything, you understand that it's not just the individual parts, but it's their relationships, both within a uh, particular network, whether it's the metabolome or the epigenome. You look at the relationships within each of those uh, individual layers, but also between the layers. There's important relationships that help shape your understanding of the whole by those uh, relationships. It's all about relationships in the systems biology approach. So omic technologies alone don't tell the whole or holistic story. It's all about their, their integration together. And these are some of the check marks there are the ones that we've been involved with so far, some of which we've analyzed, some of which we have yet to analyze fully. But that ultimately if you bring all of this information together and then perform some sort of multimodal biomarker integration by bringing all of these together, you start to approach an understanding that is holistic. And uh, by understanding the relationships between these, you'll hopefully wind up with an idea of what personalized health or what a deviation from personalized health would be, which would be a disease such as Alzheimer's disease. So in this example, I've taken some traits or characteristics to give you a two-dimensional appreciation for what a systems approach would look like. Each one of these rectangles represent a node <coughs> in a system, and the various lines between the different nodes 
represent edges or associations. Um, if you're involved in systems biology, you can sometimes come up with uh, representations of the weights of these different associations. So for example, there's a three times incidence of increased risk for late onset Alzheimer's disease if you have an APOE4 uh, allele. If you have a specific TREM2 variant, which you, these are gene variants, uh, there's a 2.7% increase in risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. A lot of these um, associations, however, are unknown at this point. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, a lot of uh, calculations, a lot of um, manipulations of data and information processing to understand how, how these relationships are actually uh, operating and how they're different in one individual from another. Uh, this is also to show you that there's genetic components, there's environmental components, for example, lack of exercise or having had a traumatic brain injury, and that the combination of these have a consequence that may also uh, be associated with increasing your risk. For example, neuroinflammation or phase shifting, which is a change in sleep, or an alteration in your gut bacteria. All of these have a role to play in developing a profile of your risk related to Alzheimer's disease. And the point I'm trying to make is that the vast majority of these have yet to be figured out. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. So Dr. Jane told me that at this point, most of you would probably be nodding off so that I should put this picture up to bring you back <laughs> to reality and you know, get you excited about this lecture. That's all I have to say about this. <laughs> the previous 2D representation is one thing, but actually we're talking about a 3D representation, which is that much more complex. So you take that matrix that Dr. Mapstone showed and you stack it up on top of each other, you put a time uh, variable in there, and then you have all of these different associations within the different layers of a three-dimensional matrix, and it might be multi-dimensional because you have to add, add time to it, so it's at least four-dimensional. Um, it's important to understand that there's all of these relationships between the different layers of the 3D matrix, and then on top of that, you have your environmental factors that play a role on, on how this is actually operating and how it ultimately results in uh, the risk of late onset Alzheimer's disease. So you have things such as diet, exercise, gut bacteria and processing of food, and other external environment, including pollution, including injuries like traumatic brain injury, um, stress, et cetera. So our laboratory is involved in trying to understand <clears throat> how some of these effects uh, related to the environment are actually working on um, our own genetic information and the epigenome. The epigenome is probably what regulates all of us and makes us slightly different. Even if we had a twin brother or sister, we would, uh, we would be different because of the epigenetic modifications. What we're learning is that a lot of environmental factors can alter these epigenetic uh, controls of our genome and can be manipulated in a way that's either positive or negative. Things such as cognitive stimulation, stress reduction, proper diet, exercise, uh, what's called healthy living, those are all things that can potentially uh, modulate your genetic information and make it relatively better for you and lead you towards a healthy lifestyle, as opposed to the opposite, which include metabolic syndrome, obesity, a sedentary life, stress. Uh, those tend to move the bar down towards a disease state. If there was a way to uh, properly uh, monitor some of these things, 
and incorporate them onto the layers associated with the 3D matrix that I just showed you and build that on top of other medically available information, we may ultimately be able to uh, monitor and potentially change our activity levels during life to make our life tend towards a healthy side of things as opposed to the disease side of things. So some of the questions that our lab is interested in asking is, can the epigenetic regulation allow us to make some course corrections? And are there biomarkers that provide actionable information to uh, not only ourselves, but to our healthcare providers that can help us maintain a lifelong state of health? And finally, how can we best integrate this information uh, to, uh, to allow us to make personal choices that are better for us in the long run in maintaining health? So this is another uh, Dr. Jane slide, but I think this one is, is much more apropos as to where we want to go at this point. There's a lot of factors involved in medical, environmental, social, and lifestyle changes that include the existing medical record that we may have, scientific medical knowledge, any new wearable sensors that we may be using, the omic information that Dr. Mapstone talked about, other data that's available, whether it's environmental data, air pollution, water pollution, anything that could influence us anything else that would be a, a connected knowledge, all of this would be incorporated into hopefully developing an individual model for each, each and every one of us that's different from your neighbor, but that would allow us to better understand where we are at this point in time and where we want to go at some point in the future. Eventually, an understanding of this type of a, a uh, data uh, integration is going to hopefully get us towards future health and hopefully taking us on the, in the direction of health rather than in the direction of disease. So one of the, one of the things that <clears throat> I've learned over the last year is that cybernetics, a concept that I wasn't really clear on and that I'm still not overly clear on, allows you to manipulate some of these data sets to hopefully, the way I look at it is it's like a thermostat that you set at a certain level or at a certain trajectory. And if you veer off of that, there's changes in controls that will allow you to come back towards your, your set course. That's like a, uh, a navigation system on your phone or in your car to get from point A to point B, but you run into a traffic jam, so you have to reroute your course another way. So the cybernetics and the P5 system, I'm hoping, or modifications thereof, uh, is going to help us stay on course with all of the previous data that we talked about. And that something like the Health Butler, and more importantly, through collaborations between computer science, the School of Medicine, and engineering, we're going to hopefully be able to get towards what's called a personal health navigator, again, for for those interested in, uh, in uh, cybernetics and uh, data processing, I think this is, this is going to be key. And that the personal health navigator, again, is going to lead us towards future health. Now, big data and big science projects um, require multidisciplinary teams. If you're, if you're uh, writing grants to the NIH, and uh, you're going to tackle a big data project of some sort, uh, they're not going to be impressed by that being a single authored uh, grant uh, proposal. Unless you've got a big, uh, a big group of experts to, to do that with, they're going to probably set that one aside and not really consider it. Big projects, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, traumatic brain injury, autism, um, all of these require multidisciplinary approaches. That's where the strength comes in. And making sure that you're not just pigeonholing your ideas to one particular way. You want to 
be able to accept and process ideas from all different sorts of people, all different expertise to, uh, to do the best possible in a systems uh, biology approach to, uh, to come up with ideas that are going to be able to handle these types of problems. We currently have a pretty, pretty multidisciplinary team in our group, as is listed below. We have a strong neuroscience background, but other types of experience in the various group members. These are our faculty members in our, in our group. But the bottom line is we need, we need people like you to be involved in these projects. And, uh, you know, I, I feel very strongly that you can't have enough, you can't have enough experts uh, as part of the team. And so I'm hoping that out of this type of talk or other, or other talks similar to this, that there will be a chance to attract as many of you as possible uh, to our team in, in trying to get to this pr problem in the future. So I'd like to thank all of you for your attention, and uh, Mark and I are more than willing to take uh, questions. So let me start by something that uh, until very recently I used to think that uh, Alzheimer's mostly genetic disease. Uh, <clears throat> lately, I am finding out more and more from uh, the new research that it depends on lifestyle. Uh, does it mean that if we can find somehow what you were indicating that it's very difficult to find uh, how you are progressing towards Alzheimer's, if we can somehow find very early, uh, we can delay the onset of Alzheimer's because uh, some of the cases among my relatives, etc., that I have seen of Alzheimer's, uh, life becomes extremely terrible uh, once uh, somebody is Alzheimer's, not only for the patient, but everybody surrounding them. So uh, do you really think that uh, this uh, metabolic biomarkers can start helping you or uh, should we focus also on cognitive decay? Uh, can we, because most of us spend time on this uh, all the time, uh, and this requires all kind of cognitive function. If in place of uh, focusing on the group thing, can we start from early days starting to notice whether something is deteriorating? Is that even possible? Does it make sense? Yeah, you, you bring up a great point, <clears throat> um, and, and I think the answer is yes. I think we're limited to a certain degree to the sensitivity of cognitive measures. Mm -hmm. And so the cognitive measures that I typically use in the clinic and that are standard use uh, are not particularly sensitive. Uh, so we really need something with a higher degree of resolution that's going to tell us when you start getting those smallest deflections from what is normal. But we also don't have a great idea of what normal is. Normal is a wide range, and it depends not only on individual normal, but also when, uh, you know, when during the day, what the, you know, stress level of the, the subject, I mean, so normal moves all around too, so it's actually a moving target. It would be really easy, well, it would be easier if normal was this and impaired was this, and then you could just measure it and then you set, but these things move around quite a bit. So you do see subtle changes in cognitive function prior to patient recognizing or noticing, and we can detect some of those on tests, but eventually you can only squeeze so much uh, information out of those tests, and they're just not going to give you enough. So that's the movement to a more um, reliable and sensitive measure that we can use, such as these biomarkers. So like, I think it's an important question, but I think it, ultimately we're going we're gonna to run up against a wall with cognitive and functional capacity measures. For it. But ultimately, um, to, before you can have something like this, be your guide. Um, and again, that's something to remember. At least on the medical side of things, before you'd have technology be able to take over for something that's been established and used over the years, it's going to be important to do tests between this and 
Dr. Mapstone's measures mm -hmm. okay. to make those correlations. And they have to be as good, if not better, mm -hmm. before before you would use this no, type. But we are talking using this only as a tool to work those yeah. tests. Yeah. I, I think you'd have to use it in, in conjunction with some other things as well. Yeah. Is, I guess what I'm saying is that there's so many variables that we can't account for if you're, if you're querying via smartphone or an actigraph or some other, you know, sort of automated manner. They, you'd have to add something else in there as well to help give you that converging information that's not just a state problem, but it's actually a, a chronic problem in the patient's cognitive function. It's not that they're just tired because they didn't sleep the night before and then they're mistyping on their smartphone. That would be a false positive. I mean, I mean, I think to minimize that, you'd have to add something else. But I think part of what you're saying, Ramesh, is if we use this during our whole life that, and we have our fluctuations pretty well mapped out, that there may be a trend that you could pick up. That's exactly what uh, yeah. I'm saying. That yeah. If you are co collecting this data all continuously, the time, you know, yeah. uh, continuously, Right. Then you have all the context, like what you are saying, that, yeah. that whether the person has slept well or not. That information will be coming from here. Mm -hmm. yeah. And again, uh, the point, that's a very important point. And, you know, there's probably other ideas that still have yet to be determined and uh, tested. But all of the tests to pass the rigor necessary for a medical type of an approach or use are going to typically need to be tested with stuff that's already been used and is tried and true, as in a lot of other uh, conditions. Yeah, so um, I, we went over the metabolome and stuff pretty quickly, but what I was curious about is you said they were discreet, you know, fasting and even took the medications for one day, but then the people had changed and converted like two years from now. So I'm worried that they were on medications like to lower their cholesterol or something like that. And so it actually would make sense. <laughs> well, I'm sure you're probably going to do this to look at those time points for those people that converted, like not just their initial time point. Is that what you're saying? You're only looking at their initial time point? Yeah. Because I would like to know. Like, did you match four medications and stuff like that to make sure that, that you're not just picking up the, whether or not they're on a cholesterol lowering drug or something like that? And maybe they got on it or off it two years later. Like, I don't know how long it takes for. Yeah, whether the, the lipid measures that we found in blood are just a surrogate for bad yeah. lipid metabolism in general, and that's why they're yeah. taking this step. <clears throat> yeah. Um, we didn't prospectively go there because we did untargeted metabolomics. We didn't go, we didn't bias the search for anything. We weren't looking for lipids in particular. So we didn't know ahead of time to balance for statin takers or not. Um, but what, what we did do is retrospectively go back and look at the groups and found that those who phenoconverted the 28 that we studied and the controls that we used them, there was no difference in proportion of individuals taking statins okay. or, or having hypercholesterolemia or triglycerides. So the, the groups didn't differ, but that's not a sufficient answer to your question, which is an important question, but we couldn't study that prospectively because we didn't know what we were looking for. This was an untargeted analysis. We didn't want to be, we didn't want to be driven by some a priori hypothesis that wouldn't open us up to other possibilities, which we found. And surprisingly, I mean, we were shocked when we saw those data. So, yeah, that's what I was like. That was, yeah, that was really good data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think it was good data because, um, not to beat my own drum, but I think that we did a good job of clinically characterizing the subjects and we, this, this problem that we... <laughs> He's very shy. <laughs> uh, but most other studies just say, you guys are AD, the rest of you are controlled. And by eliminating those people that were sort of in between and not quite and we don't know what you are, I think that allowed us to, uh, to categorically differentiate the groups clinically that then maximize the ability to differentiate them on the biological side. Now, that means we have to do a, a better job in our next step of applying this to a general, a real population, not just an artificially defined this and this group, but rather everybody. So we haven't done that yet. So that's that's the next step, and that has to be done. But, yeah, you're right. Another question? Sure. So 
Right. So it also sounded like you had only looked at the metabolomics, and you haven't looked at like the genomics or the transcriptomics to see if you know try to find out the mechanism of why this is happening. So you haven't looked at that stuff yet. Right, but the metabolomics give us that starting point. You know, that they, they allow us to backfill the trend, the proteomics and the transcripts, and now we can do targeted. Well, let's look at the you know, metabolic pathway for lipid right. dysregulation. And exactly. Are the proteins dysregulated? Yeah, okay, well, what about the transcription? You can start building that back in. And then that'll allow us, I hope, to start taking targeted approaches towards developing therapies that modulate those pathways, either at the proteomic level or the transcript level or the epigenome. It may be that exercise modulates lipid stuff and you know, exercise is something that we should be doing. But with, with the data set that we have, there's rich environment for our graduate student to do a thesis. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's plenty of work to be done, but I mean, we do need help with it. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, I came here to look for a, a, a answer about my mom. My mom is a life sentence, so and about three to four years ago, suddenly one day, she did a red line when I come home. I said, Mom, I said, who you are? And I cried. And, uh, and it, this looks to me as very <coughs> sudden. My mom did a red line me. And, uh, and uh, I sent my mom to different hospitals. And the, the doctors knew, so you were, you know, the doctors that never <coughs> cracked it. I can only help to correct some side called psych psychiatry symptoms, something. Uh, so my uh, my question is: uh, Is there any possibility that my mom can recognize me again? Uh, to what, whatever means, I from the lecture I know it's it's, it's difficult. So, yeah. The, the first question, the second question is: uh, What is the gold standard for the diagnosis of, of uh, Alzheimer's disease? I mean, the serum marker varies a lot. Like uh, she asked the question. Like uh, I was. Uh, the, uh, with the uh, liver biosis, uh, uh, liver cirrhosis diagnosis. So the liver, the serum marker does not necessarily reflect the uh, pathological change in the liver. So we need a biopsy. Mm -hmm. but, but the brain, I don't know what is the gold standard. Is it difficult to do the biopsy of the brain gland? So that's just. Not, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I understand your point. Um, Mark, did you want to? Well, I, I think it's a definitive to, diagnosis. So the first point, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. That must be very disturbing to, to have that happen. It's um, it would be unusual in a case of Alzheimer's disease to have an acute onset of prosopagnosia, which is an inability to recognize faces, particularly faces that you know. So that would be an unusual symptom uh, for presenting symptoms. So either. Something was happening before that wasn't noticed, or this was something different, um, and it's not—it's not typically seen. Um, I would say, uh, so that would be unusual for for Alzheimer's disease. So you think of something acute, like a—you know—you probably want to have that worked up by a neurologist or a psychiatrist a little more formally. I think is the point. Uh, to your second point about the biomarkers reflecting the underlying biology. Um, I think that that's the issue that has led us down a particular path chasing this amyloid stuff. These things, these plaques that Alzheimer described 120, almost 20 years ago now. Um, we've known about these. They accumulate in the brain in these patients. But we haven't seen that treating those plaques or getting them out faster or preventing them from coming in or modulating their presence at all really has any meaningful clinical outcomes. So that, that should tell us as scientists that maybe the plaques aren't the causative agent. Maybe they're correlative. Maybe they're causative in a much later sense and there's something more important that happens before. <coughs> but maybe it's time to open up our eyes to something different than amyloid and tau, which I think we've tried to do. And that's kind of the, the, the cornerstones of our work is to try to say we're not going to be um, chasing a particular pathological feature and go and find that and see if that's a marker. We're going to say, we're open to whatever might be there in the data and let the data speak. So you're right, and I, I agree that um, our approach is, is to not be tied to a particular pathological marker. We happened to find this. We weren't looking for it, but it was there, and we're following it up the way that we should as scientists. 
but there's also um, there's also very specific criteria for the clinical okay. diagnosis of mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease, and it's usually based on uh, clinical history, neuropsychological testing, and uh, that's primarily used. And then there's also a couple of other things, including the imaging studies, which are not technically absolutely required, right? Um, right, they're not um, supported by the American Academy of Neurology. Right. Yeah. What about the CSF? <coughs> CSF is a supportive aspect, so right. it's not indicated to, to confirm a diagnosis, but it's supportive if you do have CSF that shows reduced amyloid. It's kind of counterintuitive, but if you have a finding of amyloid on the CSF, um, that's to support a diagnosis. But primarily the diagnosis is made clinically. You have to go and see a, a specialist who's going to evaluate the patient, and based on the symptoms, and the impact of the symptoms on the person's life, whether they're functionally impairing, that's the criteria for the disease, and you rule out everything else. The definitive diagnosis is made at autopsy. It's the number of those plaques that you find in specific areas of the brain. So anti-mortem anti is based on a clinical evaluation. I, in, in talking to some caregivers of Alzheimer patients, I hear that there are so-called good days and bad days. Um, my guess is that would be also reflected in the metabolome. Have you thought about factoring that into your study? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, no. Yeah. no I mean, <laughs> we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't take that into account in those days, but uh, we, and again, those are the things that would respond more to a continuous monitoring type situation than on a yearly exam. Right. You're hoping that the yearly exam, by by doing the things consistently like uh, Mark and his colleagues designed originally, fasting overnight, holding your medications, having your blood drawn during a very <coughs> small window in the morning, <coughs> those types of things we were hoping would help limit variability in the metabolome. But obviously, there's other factors. You could have the flu one day and not another day, et cetera. Uh, sleep. All of those things. Environmental factors, uh, you know, states of health. Uh, one of the things that we know about uh, some of these uh, disorders in the elderly, we know that cognitive ability is altered by things like minor infections, a urinary tract infection, a ear infection, a sore throat, a dental process, those things can cause fluctuations in your cognitive ability. So we didn't, we didn't set that up in the test. Uh, we need to have some very close monitoring uh, related those, to those fluctuations, but I think your point is valid in that they do exist and they would alter potentially not only the cognitive status, but also the metabolome and maybe other other uh, omics. Yes, sir. What are the barriers to say developing a form of app that makes a diagnosis of a cognitive disease? Is that something that you guys are working on? An, an app? Yeah, for whatever, you know, something like text or... Um, what are the barriers? Well, the, the main one is <coughs> is having uh, being able to put your interpretive ability into an app uh, because it's really based on a, a lot of these currently are based on clinical experiences. We don't have there's no valid biomarkers at this point, but once once we do get valid measures that we could potentially put into an app. There, there would be a higher likelihood of being able to do that. I don't know that Mark could put all of his tests on an app and just the test results alone would be enough for anybody to interpret the results properly and give the diagnose, the clinical diagnosis. Yeah, I, I, it's a tricky question and I can see where you'd want to have something that can, I mean, if this is a straightforward problem, you should be able to create an algorithm that allow you to do that decision making. Um, it's more complicated than that because there are, there are always caveats and a lot of it is how somebody approaches a particular cognitive problem. If it's about memory and you see that they get the answer right but they really struggle with it, that actually might be more meaningful than getting the answer right versus wrong, that binary 
that, that person would be marked as getting it correct. But if you see that they use a unique strategy or something very bizarre or they have trouble with it, that qualitative information is really kind of hard to capture. And you really need to be sitting there with eyes on the patient in order to see, to see that. So I think the major difficulty is, is in implementing that. It's really just to characterize what it takes to be a person observing and judging and valuing that output. So it would be nice to have this, the scores that someone like me or somebody else could look at, but I think that, that clinical interpretation is a hard thing to quantify. People try that. But I think also that that would be useful as a screening measure yeah. to then signal someone to come in and see it, yeah. right? So you would, you would have them do that and say, you, know, you ought to come in and see somebody, and that, that might be part of the multi-step process. So that would, I think, would be useful. No, and if it's done on a on a tablet or a phone or something like that, you could probably do reaction times and things like that, yep. which would all be part of the clinical interpretation of how people do in response to a question. So I, I think early on it would need to be sort of a screening tool potentially, and it may need to be uh, not a uniform tool used by everyone, but uh, eventually if it could be uh, used enough, uh, and correlated with what's currently available, I think it could develop into a very useful approach. To follow to that, uh, we're all using one way or another our phones and other devices in point of fact to affect a close to face to face communication. So the question is have you thought of taking an app, WhatsApp, or something like that? And using that for the interview process, uh, capturing a video, possibly, and then that actually would allow multiple, uh, would allow training for one thing of other people and consistency checking and so forth. I have a friend, I'll be very brief here, she's suffering cognitive decline, and half of the problem is her getting to her appointments as opposed to. A more regular uh, interview. Yeah. So th that's the premise behind telemedicine. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So this but is telemedicine. Th th that's just formalized. Well, but it's telemedicine applied in a somewhat different way. Yeah. In other words, on a regular basis, checking in, doing the cognitive assessment, possibly in conjunction with a. You see somebody struggling to finish off the thing and you're reading yeah. the thing. But the question at that stage of the game becomes how much do you have to capture? Do you capture body posture or facial expression or or, or what is it? I mean, it may be impractical just capturing the face. That's why I'm asking. No, I, I think that that's a, a good first step. I think the more information you get is, is more useful, yeah. but uh, maybe just face is enough. But the biggest burden, I mean, the biggest barrier to that approach is reimbursement. Your parents don't pay for that yeah. uh, yet, and so it's not implemented because docs can't get paid for seeing those patients. So if you've got ten patients that are phoning in and skyping in, and you're doing an interview, you're not getting paid for that. So, so you're saying, I mean, so, it, it, so you're saying that the barrier, a barrier, one of a barrier is the lack of reimbursement. Uh, for unless it is physically present. In other words, I don't know you're delivering care unless I see you. That's right. Excuse me. The insurance company doesn't know you're delivering care unless the body is physically there. Yes. Well, there has to be some sort of documentation. Well, presumably the documentation is even better in terms of you want to go, you can take a look and re look at the tapes or whatever it is. But that I, it had never occurred to me that... Uh, that that sort of weird barrier to the use of telemedicine existed. Wow. That's exactly true. Uh, question. Uh, I, I just saw uh, some talk in the, you know, some like a computer science stuff, of course, not like a difficult people, but I think you're telling that the temporal variation, variations of like human behavior, like the way you walk or the way you can speak, like your speech, that over time, if you like really model something, you, you might be able to diagnose, for example, Alzheimer's disease or something like that. So that's an information that they like collected uh, like uh, speech from uh, Ronald Reagan, 
to a year, <coughs> we managed to, like, five years before the real diagnosis, we, we managed to get diagnosed Alzheimer's disease because they were able to look at all the species. So he was the president, all the species were available, so it's not, of course, for everybody, but they were looking at the variations and they could say or diagnose the, this disease. So first, uh, how, how kind of relevant do you see this kind of research? And uh, these, like, uh, is, because people, uh, or some, someone like me who's not a, a, a doctor or a clinician, they would always uh, look at for, like, memory related issues. However, apparently, like, the way you walk can also, uh, according to this guy, this professor, can also uh, have some correlation to Alzheimer's disease or very, very mild or chronic issues. So how, how do you think these kind of things can really help? Uh, these are the continuous monitoring which are available uh, to everybody. But, you know, because uh, Alzheimer's is something that, as you mentioned, you, you face that problem and then you meet your doctor, right? So uh, no one's like thinking, okay, maybe at the age of 60 or 50 or something, people are that much perhaps eager to start uh, like monitoring themselves because they don't see them also or the, themselves at risk. But if we have this technology like, I don't know, uh, these days, maybe it's just, uh, I don't know, Alex, Alexa from Amazon, who is always, to whom you're always talking or speaking, mm -hmm. so somebody's recording your voice, or you have, let's say, a 3D accelerometer in your phone or in your wristband, which can kind of monitor the way you walk and all those things. How do you think these kind of things uh, can immediately help you to, to perhaps augment your study? The temporal variations of normal things in your life, which might be available to, to very low cost. I think that those things are important, probably as ancillary measures, in providing additive value to a primary um, evaluation. Uh, certainly, changes in speech, in, in any sort of outward behavior, reflect what goes on in the brain. The brain controls our outward behavior. So, if you can monitor outward behavior reliably enough. And sensitively enough, you can make some pretty sound inferences about what's going on in the brain. The question I, I have is really about uh, specificity to Alzheimer's disease. So, if you've got someone with a gait issue, I'm not sure that how that directly ties to Alzheimer's pathology in the first place, but it could reflect a whole host of things from orthopedic to a knee to a bunion on the toe to you know, all sorts of different things. I worry about specificity. Language and speech, I think, is a closer tie because you can go back and you can examine the output of individuals with the disease, and it, it, you can notice things. The use of more filler words, uh, trouble coming up with words and aims, in particular, uh, what you call empty speech. You're kind of talking, but you're not really, there's no real content in there. A lot of like professors, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so there are things you can look for that, that do reflect that there's a degradation of function, but you kind of have to have a baseline first because you don't know that person's always been like that. So I think there's ancillary measures that might help us converge on a diagnosis, but I still think right now, unfortunately, we still need that face-to-face, -face, in-person clinical evaluation before we can definitively say, I think this is Alzheimer's disease, we've got to do something about it. But then the question is, what do you do? And you don't want to tell someone they have Alzheimer's disease if you're not 100% sure. So that's a devastating diagnosis. So it's better to err. Um, you don't want false positives on that. What we're also hoping is that uh, if, if we can use some of these measures in a clinical trial type setting to help us gain information about them and use them in people that are being tested in clinical trials for therapeutic measures, the information that we get will hopefully lead to improved therapeutics and our predictive ability will be increased by their clinical use. Even though they're not ready for prime time, they're, we're not recommending that they be used for screening right now, but as part of a trial, it may be very appropriate to test how accurate they are compared to the current ways we have of predicting who's going to develop the disease. Related to your <clears throat> specific question, maybe not as much related to Alzheimer's disease, but there's a lot of those types of analyses that are currently being done for Parkinson's disease, both for speech and gait and tremor measures and things like that. Those are very useful 
And again, uh, currently society is not using this information during life. You know, kids start with cell phones now, I'm sure, in grade school. And you could have a collection of information from some of these people for 40, 50 years before you know it. And, uh, and you know, that data is there to be mined. And the question is, what can you gain from that sort of information? Can you actually use that to be impactful in some decision making that we're currently not even able to comprehend? So you just said PI accuracy, so how come you're not recommending it for more widespread use? Uh, positive predictive value is very low. Short, short answer. Um, when you apply that accuracy to a base rate in a population of about Three percent of the population, or maybe even less. Um, that sort of accuracy is not going to get you a good positive predictive value, and so you're going to make false positive diagnoses. And, and again, it's problematic. Th this isn't heart attack or you know MIs or something like that. It's not an acute someone's going to die of it right away, but it's it's a diagnosis you don't want to give somebody unless you're pretty confident about. So at this point, it, we just don't have the accuracy we need to. And we're hoping that that accuracy will come by the combination of all of these measures. And, and that's the bottom line as to what we're trying to do with this talk, is to get people excited about helping us putting all that together. Thank you very much, sir. This was wonderful. Uh, you presented it in a way that uh, even computer scientists could understand. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.